Good morning. Good to see everyone that we have out this morning. We are really glad that you are here on today, the Lord's Day, to come together to worship the Lord. We're grateful, especially for our visitors. We're glad that you're here and that you have come our way, and we'd invite you back as you might have opportunity. This evening we're going to meet again for another period of worship at 6.30, uh, and if you can make it back for that, that would be wonderful. And on Wednesday, we will be meeting for a period of Bible study at 7 o'clock, uh, 7 p.m. So we invite you back as you have opportunity, but we are so grateful to have you here. Grateful that you've chosen uh, to be here to, to worship the Lord. And there's, uh, to me, no greater place that you could be this morning than right here worshiping uh, with the Lord's saints. You know, when I was little, probably you have experienced this as well, a book that is very famous, story you could say, of the little train that could. And in that story, there was this massive load for this train to haul, and really the only thing that powered him was the power of positivity where he would say over and over again I think I can I think I can I think I can and that mantra has become the mantra of many and really that that story has become a, a almost a cultural thing where we tell ourselves of the power of positivity that if we think we can if we believe that we can then we can indeed do great things and to some extent I believe that that is the case that when we are positive with ourselves when we believe that we can we can achieve great things and this morning I want to talk about that idea the power of positivity if you will and really just reinforce that there are some things that we need to be positive about Things that we need to believe that we can do. And so let's talk about that this morning. Let's talk about two little words, I can. I want you to think to yourself this morning as we talk about these things, that these do apply to you. Not you can't, not thinking, you know, this person can, you can, or maybe they can, but I can. I can do these things. Number one, I can overcome temptation. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we talk about temptation to sin, we're talking about something that everyone deals with. And yet, many people, if not everyone, at some point in their lives think there's no way that I can overcome this. There's no way that I can not give in to this temptation to sin. But we need to understand the truth of Scripture. Scripture says that we can. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. The Bible clearly says here that when temptation comes, I can overcome it. I can escape. Why is that the case? Well, it's because of God. God is faithful. He's not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear. That is the idea that there's nothing that we are so overcome with that we cannot resist it, that it is not within our ability. God's not going to let that happen. But also... He is going to, with the temptation, provide the way of escape. Every time we are tempted to sin, 
We need to be looking for that exit sign. We need to be looking for that way of escape, knowing that God has put it there. Also turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. This deals with the nature of temptation. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James tells us two things about temptation here, and I'm going to deal with them in reverse order of how they appear. Number one, he says, God isn't the one tempting us. We are tempted by our own desires. When we are drawn away by our own desires, that's how temptation works. But to me, even more important than understanding how temptation works is understanding that there is a point to it. There is a purpose and there is a goal and an end to it. And that comes in verse 12 where my translation says, Blessed is a man who per perseveres under trial. But I believe the New King James Version says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. We understand that if we overcome, if we endure when we are tempted, that we are blessed. That when we have been approved, we will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to all those who love Him. There's a point to our temptation. There is, there is an end to it that if we can endure, if we can overcome, if we can prove our faithfulness to the Lord, that we're going to be rewarded. And so understand that it's not God tempting us. In fact, God is helping us in our temptations. But rather, we have to overcome. And we can overcome. I can overcome whatever Satan is throwing my way. Along that same line, I can change. Too, too much in our culture... Have we been fed the lie that the way that we were born is the way that we always will be? <clears throat> now, I understand genetics. I understand that there are certain parts of me that are not going to change because I'm ge genetically predisposed to certain looks and certain things and certain parts of my body, but... As far as our relationship with God, as far as whether we are sinful or faithful to God, we most certainly can change. I want you to look at one example of such in 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. And verse, we'll start in verse 12. This is Paul the Apostle speaking. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. You think about Paul the, inform, the former Apostle Paul, we know him more as Saul. Saul was a blasphemer. He denied Jesus. He was a persecutor. He looked to take Christianity and stamp it out by taking those people who would profess Christ 
and put them in prison, or worse, kill them. He was a violent aggressor. He was a violent man. He was angry. Now, he acted ignorantly in unbelief. But these were the characteristics of Paul before. He blasphemed, he persecuted, and he was violent and angry and wrathful. And yet, he was shown mercy and was considered faithful because of the change that was made within him. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And because of that light, because of seeing Jesus, because of understanding Him to be the risen Jesus, the risen Lord, He made a complete change. And no longer was He a blasphemer. No longer was He a persecutor. No longer was He this violent aggressor. But He became... Just the opposite. He glorified God in His speech and in His actions. He was being persecuted for the cross of Christ. And violence, while violence was being done against Him, He did not answer in kind. Paul changed. We read of another example in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 9, Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says in verse 11, Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. You know, you look at that list in 1 Corinthians 6, and you have sins that the world would consider to be taboo. The world would be considered to be unredeemable in some cases. Fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. And they would say, no, you can't change. You can't become anything different than what you are. The Bible says differently. The Bible offers up proof time and time again that yes, you can change. The Corinthians were some of these things. Such were some of you, but they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They changed. And while they still had some issues to work out, if you read Corinthians, the, the book of 1 Corinthians especially, Yes, they still had some worldliness in them, some, some things to work out, but they had changed. And by the time you read 2 Corinthians, they continued to make changes and continue to improve. And we could go on and read about what Paul says about the Ephesians and about the Thessalonians and all these Christians, how they were formerly darkened and evil and children of wrath. But the power of the gospel was such that they changed. And so if you're sitting here thinking today, you know, this vice that I have in my life, I'm always going to have it. I'm always going to be who I am. Don't think that way. The power of the gospel is such as that, yes, you can change. You could become a completely different person than the one you are right now. I can change. We also need to be telling ourselves, I can teach others. 
I realize some of us are more comfortable talking to other people than others. Some of us are more comfortable talking to strangers than others. But, each and every single one of us needs to understand, yes, I can teach others. Some of us are more knowledgeable than others. Some of us are more mature in our, our walk with Christ. But every single one of us can teach. You know, I think about the example of Andrew. John chapter 1, if you turn over there. You know, Andrew is the forgotten brother, right? We always talk about Simon Peter, and rightfully so. The Bible does focus more on Peter and the things that he said, the things that he did. But I want you to understand that without Andrew, there is no Peter. Notice in John chapter 1 and verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak, talking about John the Baptist, and followed him, was Andrew, Simon's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Andrew was the one who brought Peter to Jesus, who told Peter about Jesus. And so, like I said, if there's no Andrew, if there's no Andrew hearing about what John the Baptist said and following Jesus, then we don't have Simon Peter. And we don't really know a lot about Andrew. We don't know if he had the same boisterous personality as Peter. But seeing that he doesn't speak up as much as Peter, at least as recorded, I would say probably not. I'd say that they were probably different, as brothers sometimes are. But we need to re remind ourselves that we don't have to be a Peter. We don't have to be everything. We can do what we can do. I want to take you to another example in Acts chapter 9. And that should say Acts chapter 9 and verse 20 on the slide there. Acts chapter 9 and verse 20. We just talked about the conversion of Saul. And I want to start in verse 18. This is right after... Ananias comes to him and it says, And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Now Paul had just been converted, or Saul as he's talking uh, Described here, given that name. Saul had just been converted. Fresh convert. And yet immediately he goes into the synagogues and he starts preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, I realize that Paul had divine revelation. But what, from what we read in the book of Galatians, it doesn't seem like it was all at once that immediately he was just filled with all the knowledge and everything that he needed to know. No, it, it was over a period of two years that he was in Arabia that he seems to have received divine revelation from Jesus himself. And yet immediately he goes out and he's zealous and he's bold and he's teaching these people that Jesus is the Son of God. And then if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 2. Paul says to Timothy, 
the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice what Paul does not say to Timothy here. This is not how the verse goes. He does not say, Timothy, the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to keep teaching these men, and you and only you are going to be teaching these people. Not everybody can teach Timothy, but you, I've I've chosen you so that you can teach these things, and you just keep on teaching. You're the preacher there, you've got full control, you keep teaching. That's not what Paul says. He says, you teach these to faithful men, trustworthy men, so that they also can teach. Timothy isn't just teaching them the things that are being said, and he only, but rather he's teaching these to faithful men so that they also can teach others. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, talking about the gifts that God has given to the church, pastors and prophets and apostles and teachers and all those things. And he says, it's for the purpose of equipping the saints for ministry. The saints need to be equipped as well so that they can teach others. And so it doesn't matter if you're not a Simon Peter. It doesn't matter if you're fresh off the streets and a new convert. It doesn't matter if you've got a strong preacher like Timothy teaching you. Understand that you can teach others. You're never going to know everything there, there is to know, but you know something, don't you? You know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If you've obeyed the gospel, if you've become a Christian, you know why you obeyed, right? Well, why can't you just simply tell that to others? We need to have the power of positivity at our side and realize, yes, I can teach. I can teach others. Along that same line of thought, I can make a difference. Oftentimes we get bogged down in self-talk of thinking that really there's not much that I personally can do. Maybe we're doubtful in our abilities. Maybe we're doubtful of our sphere of influence. Maybe we think, You know, I don't really know all that many people outside of people at church. But understand that we as Christians are put in a position to make a difference. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus, in speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, speaks to His disciples, speaks to those who are listening, and He says, You're the salt of the earth. Now, we all know from eating, especially here in America, we love our salt. We know the difference between eating something that is seasoned and something that is not. Something that is bland. 
And yet Jesus says, we are the salt of the earth. What, what does that mean? Well, it means that we can make a difference, right? It means that when somebody is looking to process the truth, as Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 4, our speech can be seasoned with salt. And we can help make the truth more palatable, not in, in, in a dishonest way, but in a way that it's more understandable and more relatable. But also, not just by the way that we teach, but by the way that we live. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We understand that in the world it is darkness. And people are looking to get out of that. They're looking for a way out. And of course, Jesus is the light of the world. But Jesus says that we are the light of the world as well. That we can show others the way to Jesus. And that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, so it should be with us that we should not snuff out our own influence. And one way that we can snuff out our own influence is by thinking that we have none. By defeating ourselves. I want you to notice what Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter three. Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter three and verse one, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known as and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on table, tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul talks about this concept of a letter of commendation. We, we get this today. We would see this in secular work that if you're applying for a job, maybe you list a reference. And usually that's done over the phone, but sometimes a reference can send in some kind of letter over email or even handwritten and say, I recommend such and such for this position, knowing that he is of good character and that he is fit, uh, has the skills fit for this job, and, and so on and so forth. That's a letter of commendation. And one thing that Paul's dealing with in Corinth is that he's dealing with people who are trying to, up, to uproot what Paul has done, who are trying to become greater than Paul and snuff out his influence. And he says... I don't need a letter of commendation to you or from you in order to, to be legitimate. And the reason that he says that is that the Corinthians are his letter. That they point to his legitimacy as a teacher, as an apostle. But even more than that, he says that you are a letter of of Christ. Now, there's two different ways to read that. One is saying that it is a letter of recommendation from Christ. But I almost take this to mean that in a sense they're a letter of, of commendation for Christ. That in their own lives, in their own living, that they point others to Christ and show His legitimacy. Now, that's not to say that Christ's legitimacy is contingent upon the Corinthians and how they live. 
But the way that their lives had been changed, the way that they had acted and become Christians, was in a sense a letter of commendation for Christ. Not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. And not written on tablets of stone, but written on their hearts. Brethren, I think the same can be said of us. That we are letters of Christ. That when other people look at us, they have an opportunity to see a reason to be joined with Christ. They have an opportunity to see a reason to be converted. And we ought not to think that we can make no difference. That we are too small or too insignificant, but rather in the way that we live in our quote-unquote ordinary lives as Christians, we can make a huge impact on someone else. And not just one someone else, but multiple someone else's. You can make a difference. I can make a difference in people's lives. In the grand scheme of things. I can make a difference when it comes to God being glorified. I can understand the Bible. I gave an invitation on this not too long ago, so I'm not going to belabor at this point. But I understand that there are a lot of people out here to, out in the world today who says who say that I can't understand the Bible. It's too difficult. It's been distorted. It's been warped. Well, that's simply not what Scripture says. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says to the Ephesians here, he says, by referring to this, this is Ephesians 3 verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Paul's talking about his epistles and his writing, and he says, when you read these things, you can understand my insight and apostles' insight into the mystery of Christ. Things that had been given to him by divine revelation. Things that had been to entrusted Things that had been entrusted to him by Jesus himself. We can understand those things too. By reading the things that Paul has written. Paul would go on to say in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He wouldn't tell the Ephesians to understand what the will of the Lord is if they couldn't. Rather, we can. We can understand what the will of the Lord is. Scriptures lay out that we absolutely can understand them. We can understand the will of God for our lives. And when people claim that the Bible has been distorted, or people claim that there's really no way to understand this book. It's just too complicated. Understand that they are not agreeing with what the Bible says about itself. And essentially what they are doing is they are limiting God. Because if they say, we can't understand the Bible, what they're saying is, God's Word is not powerful enough to come through to us. God is not powerful enough to make His will understandable to us. And certainly we don't want to limit God. We don't want to blaspheme Him by making Him seem less powerful than He actually is. God is all powerful. And so God can... Have us understand what His will is. And, Paul, and God said through the Apostle Paul, 
when we read the Scriptures, we can understand that. We can understand what the will of the Lord is. So don't think that you're not smart enough. Don't think that these words are too old or too outdated. Whatever excuse you can come up with to make, make it seem like, you know, I shouldn't even try reading the Bible. I shouldn't even try because I can't understand it. Realize that God says different. I can go to heaven. <laughs> Oftentimes people want to read a verse like Matthew chapter 7. And they want to say, well, if it's that difficult, I might as well not bother. Matthew chapter 7. Turn over there for just a moment. Matthew 7 and verse 13. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. They read that statement by Jesus when they say, The way is broad, and there are many who go to destruction. But the way that leads to life is small and narrow. And only a few find it. Well, I'm not that special. I'm not a good person. I don't have what it takes to go to heaven. Maybe they start comparing themselves to others and think, well... You know, if, if they're struggling, if they don't seem to have it all together, then there's no way that I could. The point of Jesus' statement here is not to say, well, you may, might as well just stop trying. It, it's too hard for you. That's not what Jesus says. He says, enter through the narrow gate. Yes, he, he warns that the gate is wide and broad that leads to destruction and many people follow that. And the gate is small and narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. But he says to them, you enter through the narrow gate. That warning that it's not the path most often taken is an exhortation to be vigilant is an exhortation to find that narrow way. You can. You can find that narrow way that leads to life, that leads to heaven. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. In the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is exhorting people who are thinking about stopping. They're thinking about quitting. Who are thinking, you know what? Living this life for Christ is too hard. And one of the things that the Hebrew writer exhorts them with is the idea that there is a reward waiting. He talks about it in, in verse chapter 4. That there's a rest that remains for the people of God and that we should be diligent to enter it. Not like the children of Israel who, who did not enter into the rest because of unbelief. But notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Who's the cloud of witnesses? Everybody that he's talked about in, in Hebrews chapter 11, and not just them, but 
Everyone else who won the victory of faith. Everyone else who went to heaven. How'd they do it? By faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up. By faith, Noah being warned about by God about things not yet seen and reverence prepared an, I, an ark and so on and so forth. By faith, these people won the victory. And he says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The writer of Hebrews paints this picture of us being in this competition, of running a race, and this cloud of witnesses surrounding us are like fans in a stand who are cheering us on. But these aren't just any fans, these are former competitors who have done it themselves, which, by the way, culturally speaking, in games like this, there would be mentors, people who had done it before, who would train the athletes who were doing it. And so, not only are they fans, but they're also coaches in a sense. People who have done it before, saying, you can do it. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who, ha who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Not only do we have this great crowd of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on, saying, I did it, you can do it too, lay hold of the prize by faith, but they are also pointing us to Jesus. And that's who we need to be fixing our eyes on. Jesus is at the finish line, so to speak. And we ought to fix our eyes on Him, not glance to the left or the right, but focus on Him and bound toward the finish line. Because do you know who also did all the things that we ourselves are trying to do today? Jesus did. Jesus is telling us that we can do it. Because He did it. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And He ran that race. And He ran it perfectly. And He sat down at the right hand of God. He received His reward. And we need to consider Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we need to consider Him when we're thinking, I can't do this. I can't run any longer. I want to give up. The Bible says we can go to heaven. We can receive that reward. Jesus endured such hostility by sinners against Himself. As we talked about in the Lord's Supper, when we read 1 Corinthians 11, the bread represents His body, which was broken on our behalf. Tristan, in his invitation on Wednesday, talked about all the things that Jesus went through physically, the pain, the suffering. The fruit of the vine represents His blood that was shed. Jesus lost so much blood on the cross. He would have been subject to dehydration as well as many other things. That blood was poured out for us. If Jesus can overcome the things that He did, 
than we, looking to Him, clinging to Him? Yes, we can overcome. I can do it. I can go to heaven. And don't let Satan, don't let anyone else tell you differently. Because the Bible tells us that we can. And I'd rather believe God than believe anyone else, including myself. Now, I've talked about the power of positivity this morning, and I've used the word I a lot more than I typically do. In that, when we look at these things, I can overcome temptation. I can change. I can teach others. I can make a difference. I can understand the Bible. I can go to heaven. Yes, you can. But, understand that it's not by your own power of your will. It's not by the strength of your might. It's not by your own righteousness. No, it's because of God. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul says, I can do all things. Through Him who strengthens me. And so we, yes, ought not to fall prey to negative self-talk and think that we can't do these things. But understand that it is not I who do these things, but rather Christ who strengthens me. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is not I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. We can do these things because Christ strengthens us to do these things. And that's what we have to remember. Is that we're not in it alone. Jesus is helping us. Jesus is strengthening us. And through Him we cannot lose. So this morning, I'd ask you, do you have Jesus on your side? If you have not put your trust in Him, if you're trying to live this life on your own, you're going to fail. And you're going to enter into that broad way that leads to destruction. It's only through Jesus that you can do the things that we talked about this morning and so much more. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, are you willing to repent of your sins? To turn away from living a life of sin and turn toward living faithfully to Jesus? Are you willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before men? Confess Him so that He will confess you before the Father. Are you willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins? If you haven't done those things, then you have not put your trust in Jesus. You have not been crucified with Christ. And you need to put yourself away and start living for Christ. Take up your cross and follow Him. If you have been baptized for the remission of your sins, but you've turned back to living a life of sin, then you too are not living for Christ. You're not putting your trust in Him, but you've rather gone back to putting your trust in yourself. At this time, as we are about to sing this invitation song, you'll have an opportunity to make that right. You can come forward and confess your sins and the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you. Or if you need to be baptized, there's an opportunity for you to come forward and do that this morning. So if you have any need, won't you come while we stand and sing?